Greetings, everybody. It's Wednesday night in Bangkok, which means it's time for another episode of Field Gemology Talks. My name is Justin K. Prim, and I'm going to be one of your hosts tonight. And we are going to have another journey around. Actually, instead of journeying around the world tonight, we're going to probably more likely be journeying through time uh, as we talk about the evolution of the colored gem and jewelry supply chain. So today, amazingly enough, this is our 14th webinar our 14th week in a row of, of doing these uh, virtual field gemology adventures. So while we're stuck inside and we can't do too much and we can't leave the country, we can go on journeys you know, in our minds with our guests and uh, with all of these photos and videos. So thank you guys so much for being here. If you haven't seen some of these before, uh, everything's up on YouTube now. And uh, we're going to continue on with these talks and continue on with the YouTube uh, uploads until we, until we run out of things to say, I guess. So, uh, Vincent, if you're ready, uh, come on in and we can, we can kick it off tonight. Hello, Justin, and hello, everybody. Good evening. Yeah, you, you're right. We are, well, we are going to continue. We have uh, currently three more talks that are scheduled. And then after that, uh, we are going to think about, uh, maybe it'll be different, but uh, there might be some surprise. Okay. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've talked to so many people so far. I, every time that we do this now, I just love looking at this wall of, of guests that we've had because really, um, we, we've been like almost to every continent. And I, I think tonight we're going to maybe fill in a little bit if we start to talk a little bit about uh, emeralds in Colombia. I don't know how much we'll get into that conversation, but that does fill in a little bit of the gap mm -hmm. in our in our guest map here. So that that yeah. could be interesting. Um, yeah, so, indeed. Today we have. Yeah. No, please. Yeah. No, I was just going to say what's so what's the what's the backstory here with you and Jean Claude? What's the uh, what's your your history with him? Well, it's quite uh, simple actually. The my history with Jean Claude started in uh, two thousand five. At that time, I was uh, starting my career as a director from the AIGS uh, lab in, uh, in Bangkok. And we work on uh, an article about the leg glass treatment for, for rubies. That was a new treatment that arrived in 2004. And there was the ICA Congress in uh, early uh, February, I think, 2005. And the ICA Congress was in Bangkok. And uh, we sent uh, this article to uh, hundreds and hundreds of emails, including Jean-Claude emails that I found. And then Jean-Claude was uh, very interested with the article on, uh, when I went to the ICA Congress of the Bangkok show, you know, I met Jean-Claude and uh, we became an uh, immediate friend. He was super friendly. I was very surprised because many people in the industry are a little bit, uh, you know, conservative as a first approach and things like that. But Jean-Claude was super friendly. He was he had a lot of information about what was going on in the trade. And when I told him that, uh, you know, I wanted to go to the field and things like that, he was one of the person who really encouraged me to do that. And even more, you know, he was one of the rare person who provided me some useful contacts, some very useful contacts. And all this program with Expedition in 2005, I think without Jean-Claude help, it would have been a disaster because when we started the, the program, I had no contact basically in Kenya and in Tanzania. And it is Jean-Claude who put me, uh, you know, who was nice, nice enough to open me his uh, contact through the kind of uh, uh, ICA ambassador network. And uh, he decided, uh, you know, discuss with people at ICA and ICA decided to be a, a kind of... Uh, uh, official uh, sponsor for our field expedition program in 2005 that we did with the AGS and Google in, and uh, helping us with contact. And it was great. It was super useful. Very cool. I know. And, and it comes to you later. Jean-Claude, uh, since 2005, you know, uh, every time I contact him, he provides me great advice. And also, not just to me, because... Uh, the great thing with Jean-Claude is, uh, you know, at this time he started uh, In Color magazine and uh, every uh, issue of In Color magazine is uh, quite amazing because this is the only uh, really, uh, it's, a, it's a trade magazine that is focusing uh, not really on just, uh, you know, the geomology side, but cover all the side of the Colorstone uh, trade. 
And Jean-Claude was in contact with many people for this magazine and has all the time some very interesting insight about the industry. So he is a kind of a special character. And uh, he was uh, one of the most uh, supportive persons that I found in the industry when I wanted to build this uh, field expedition program. Yeah. Cool. And I wanted so to- So it would be great to, uh, to listen to him tonight and ask him a few questions about, he, you know, he started in the industry. I was barely born. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he has an incredible experience and he has seen things and evolution that, you know, I, I didn't witness because I started actually uh, to uh, see what was going on in the industry. Uh, I became gemologist in 2001, not yet. In a few months, it will be 20 years uh, that I became a gemologist. I'm not yet 20 years experience regarding gemology. I started to study gemology in November 2000. So I don't have yet 20 years experience. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's got something on all of us, really. I, 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 I'm trying to just pull up. I wanted to pull up the, uh, the in color uh, site for anybody who hasn't seen it because all three of us have, have some stuff in the new magazine, which is this one. So if you guys haven't seen it, you can go, it's free to look at. You can, you, you can go online on in, uh, yeah. what gemstone.org in color. And um, it's all up there for free. The new issue is great. I feel like it's kind of a, almost a historically focused issue because there's so much cool stuff about the history of field gemology, the field history of lapidary, the history of concave cutting. And there's a bunch of cool, which to me is fun. I love the historical stuff. So, um, so I and guess what, we is great, uh, what is great in Incolo, it's uh, every issue is the kind of tutti frutti of people with different background and see that there is a, a global uh, uh, idea about uh, every given issue. But uh, Jean-Claude is all the time picking up people, sometimes that I don't even know. And then you read the article and you get a different perspective about many aspects of the trade that is uh, very useful. And his editorial are just great. Yeah. If you follow the editorial, you know, issue by issue, you can have a very good uh, idea about the evolution of the gem trade along the years. Yeah. So, so yeah. and it's, I, I don't know if every single issue is up here, but it seems like they are, which is kind of an awesome archive. You can go back and yeah. see how things developed. So I guess we should we should bring him in and and uh, yeah. get his take on this whole thing. So uh, Jean Claude, if you, if you are ready, um, come on in. Just hit start video and unmute, and we will do our thing. Yeah, don't forget to unmute. There you go. Welcome. I am. Uh, good evening. Good well, evening. we all will see that I heard. My God, you know, I can't stand in my room anymore. <laughs> The room is too small. <laughs> well, you are too big. You know, maybe that's the point. <laughs> but that's so anyway, true. So yes, it's true. Everything I say is true, Jean Claude. You are well, well. probably the one of the person who is uh, most easy, you know, to uh, provide great information. And you're doing that also in this magazine in Incolor, and which is great. Very useful. Well, okay. Well. Yes, this is a way of communication. And I, you know, I think the industry has always needed people who carried the word and, and put the different aspects of the industry together. And when I met you in 2005, you were a rookie. You had just studied gemology in Burma. I, I, it made me laugh, you know. It, it was a Burmese gemology. That's what, what you were. And I, and, but he was, he, he came from the tourism industry and he was yeah. a, a born traveler. He was an adventurer. It was a perfect guy to go and everywhere. It was so motivated that I say, we have all the, I know everybody in Africa, I'm gonna call people, they will take you to all the places you need to go. One thing I told him, when you have a story, give it to me. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but go, because there are some stories. Just yeah, of course, of course. Of course, well, that was the beginning yesterday. How we, it's how we started. And I, uh, yeah, so, and you're still there? I'm still with I don't I don't like his hat, but it's okay. I've told you that before. That's why I didn't took it today. Usually on all this <laughs> webinar, I have my hat that is here. Yes. And then today, as usual, I start to put the hat on and say, Oh no, I told Justin, no, no, I'm discussing with Jean-Claude. I cannot put the hat, he will give me a headache. <laughs> he will give me a hat time. So I put the hat okay, on the so side and I say, Okay, today no hat. <laughs> okay. So good evening to everybody. Um uh, I'm grateful to you and Justin to have me here tonight. And I will try to explain through my own experience and also my, my brainstorming, 
how I'm seeing the industry, where it comes from, where I come from, and I think we are hitting. Sounds fun. So let's start off just with a little bit of information about you from your own words. So how did you, how did you get into, you know, your, into the trade and into the uh, Emerald business in Colombia? What, what got you started with all that stuff? Well, briefly, I was, uh, I was uh, an ex a young executive in an American multinational corporation, and I was traveling to Colombia uh, often and South America, and I fell in, really in love with emeralds and with the Colombian woman. And it did it, you know. I just decided that I had to leave my job. I had to go and live in Colombia, and it was just at the turn of the uh, emerald, uh, emerald industry legalization. It became legal in 1977. I started thinking about moving into emerald in probably 74, and I made the move in 76, just at the turn of the legalization. So I was right starting when it became legal. So it was really easy because, you know, Pioneer at this time was very easy. Just before that time, you still could do business, but in, with a gun in the street. Not exactly like that, but it was really dangerous. And it, it didn't become safe the next day, but at least there was a frame, a legal frame, and illegal frame are really important. This is how the industry built up on the legal frame. So I started like this, and then it was Emerald, and I was in love with Emerald at the beginning. So my only knowledge, my only curiosity. Well, how that? You muted yourself. Yeah. Okay. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. So I started with Emeralds, and uh, I can show you a little video of for what it was. That was like not exactly the first years because I have lost all of my photos of the first year, but that's about 10 years later. Yeah, so you can see that it was. You know, I was in the office, in my office, 10 years later in Bogota. So I, I, I was cutting. I had uh, cutters, six cutters at the time, which was enough in Colombia. We have six cutters at this time. And I think this video has gone to the end. There's no, there's no beginning. It's OK. Or maybe, maybe yes. Yeah, yeah, it's OK. When I was younger, as you can see. And <laughs> that's the first time I see you with uh, hair. Well, you, you see oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, okay. People were wearing guns. Everybody was wearing guns. I was wearing a gun, too. It was, you just need it. It's like, you need to, you didn't have to use it, but you had to wear it. So this is just showing the daily, you know, putting the, I was at this time cutting and putting the merchandise, the goods on the street. So those people were what we call here brokers. They came every morning and we give them some parcels for sale. And they went to the street with a minimum price and try to get an offer, just like here. So I was doing that, cutting and putting all the material out to the street. I was also looking at what was on the on, on the on the market because you get orders that you know could provide for what you cut. So I had to look around and complete whatever orders there were from whatever was available. So it's really like a bourse. You sell, you cut, you buy. Yeah. And what what was the how did you have such a cool video? Was that Part of a some documentary or something. Oh, I have I have many many many, but I just I just found back my videos yesterday because they were in the, in, the, in, in 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 a box in a box somewhere buried, so I didn't have really time to to, to get some. But I have hours and hours of videos. Yeah, but I, yeah, but I saw you had like the pistol in the side, like uh, this is just yes, normal. Yes, I did. Okay. It was normal. It was yeah. You, you had to wear a gun. I mean. You know, you had to you had to wear a gun. It's not that you need to use a gun, but you need to use. You know, you, this show. is the way it was. You, you just yeah. had a gun somewhere. They knew you had a gun. You, you, that's it. And the guys were wearing gun because when you when you go from one building to the other, it could be dangerous. You could be attacked and get robbed. You know, even yeah. though in in the Emerald District nobody robbed anybody. Okay. Because of this, because everybody was was armed. Okay. But it's just a deterrent. It's like part of you know, this this was. This, these pictures are 88, mm -hmm. back in 88. Okay. So it was like nine years after I started, really. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a gun when I started because I couldn't even buy a gun. 
I don't have, I didn't have any money for that. I was putting all, all my money in emeralds. And I was paying 10% commission to the guy who taught me the business. He had a secured office in a secured building. He spoke languages. He was a, a son of a very prominent emerald family, but he was educated, university educated. And, and he had the ideas of buying a whole floor of a building. And I was friend with him. And they said, okay, why don't you divide it in small offices and get people not renting your offices, but getting commission and helping them how to buy it. That's what they did. He became very rich. And at that time, the biggest buyers were the Japanese. Japanese market was number one. They were buying probably 80, 90% of all emeralds in Colombia of top quality emeralds. Wow. Very rich. And they were. So in, in, in a couple of years in Bogota, two, three years, you had many Japanese company opening broker, brokering house, getting married with Colombian women to get the, you know, make it easier. And they opened shop and they were receiving many Japanese buyers. And it lasted until Japan started to decline. Then we saw the Korean. Then it was Korean coming. And then the Korean, same, same profile. They married uh, Colombian women and they set up shop for emeralds. But at the same time, Korean were also opening casinos because it was a big time of drug laundering, drug money laundering in Colombia. So you had, I mean, every corner of the, of, of, of the city, you had casino open. And the Korean was in that business in opening. Well, of course, it was not for the casino itself because they were probably into the laundering. Thing. And they were also in the emerald. And then all of a sudden they disappeared. That Korea disappeared from the business, from the main, major business. And there were no, there's not one Korean in, in Colombia this time. There are still, I think, a couple of Japanese descents, the son of Japanese, but mm -hmm. no more, uh, no more uh, Korean. Yeah. So this is the story of how it started in, in Bogota, and this is the environment in which I grew in the business. Wow. And so, so you were, you were taught, you found a master, and he taught you how to buy emerald, and you gave him a 10% commission for, for how many years? Yes. For two years. I mean, my commissions lowered, was lowered to 6% the second year. But the first year I paid 10% because I, I started with $10,000. So, you know, I had to pay 10%. But the guy was clever because he knew that your 10,000 would become more and more and more. And you know, he was making money. And he had nine offices. And, and I tell you, offices at the beginning of the legalization of the emerald trade in the 70s, the nine offices were always full. Always, always full with buyers. And of course, rapidly you start buying 220, 30, 40, 50. And they were, there was a guy called Takachita. The guy was coming every month and a half. At this time, he was buying half a million, six hundred thousand dollars every time. Wow. And, and of course, the commission with Takachita was lowered to 4%, something like that. But you know, that was big, big, big money. Because uh, Danilo was also making some money with, the, with some of the sellers. When it was his family, his family was from Chivor, and Chivor was producing at the time. And the Italians were very, very uh, in love with Chivor, the clarity, the brightness. So there were big people from uh, from uh, Italy coming also, two or three big, big guys. Uh, and so whenever it was a business from Chivor, he could get the production from the mine that has just come from the, the cutters and get it to the Italians. So he was, of course, making money both sides. But he was protecting his customers because he wanted the customers to make money and come back. It was very sad. This is how business started in Colombia. And Japanese and other people who set up kind of similar shops did the same thing. They were protecting the customers. So after two years, I opened my own office and I also did some brokerage. I was receiving some people who wanted to buy emeralds. And then that's how I learned. I learned on the field. Then I, be, I studied gemology like eight years later. Oh, you started eight years in the business and then you studied gemology. Yes, yes, yes. Because I was interested in other gemstones. I knew everything that I had, had to know on, 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 on emeralds. But I, I was interested in other stones because I started to go like six years later. I started to go to Asia to sell my emeralds. And to be able to sell in Bangkok emeralds, you had to take so far and rubies in part of the payment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I had to learn about other things. I was, I was interested in all the stories. And I was getting my, I was making a stopover in Europe, selling some so far and ruby and keeping what I, I, I couldn't sell in Europe for Colombia, the lower part. And Colombia, they were buying, not, not much, but they were buying, of course. What did you study? 
how do you study gemology? You study like uh, in uh, in campus, or how do you do study? Yeah, no, no, yes, I, I, I studied in yes, I, I, I studied in campus. Yes, I did. I studied. I studied in campus. Yes, I went. I went to Paris and I did my class. Okay. Okay. And then, so how long were you in Colombia before you moved to Thailand? Oh well, I, I, I was thirty six years in Colombia, and I I didn't move from Colombia to Thailand. I, um, I I made a stopover for six seven years, one kind of in Paris, in in which I was I mean I had an apartment in Paris and I was moving back to Colombia well wherever I've been traveling a lot so I was kind of living in Paris but not as a resident as a non-resident because I didn't spend more than six months in Paris I was less than six months anyway I was a few months in New York but then I was not living properly in Colombia because my health didn't allow me the business has changed a lot. Business is vertical. I'm not a miner. I'm somebody who is interested in other stones and other things. So, you know, I moved into other areas. Yeah. And and Colombia was very. It's very difficult in Colombia to do business to make money if you're not in the vertical big thing, uh, because you are big mine big. And then, okay. And then I, Bogota is in two two thousand six hundred meters above sea level, and I have uh, breathing issues and I had a heart attack twenty years ago and like and things made it that I couldn't live in Bogota because of the a breathing problem. Okay. So yeah. where do you move? Well, I can't, I can show you what. What? Where did you move after Colombia? What was your next step? But I went to France, like I said, for the first six years, seven years, and from France going everywhere, and then it's Bangkok, Bangkok, end of seven, oh, 2017. I got my visa on November 2017, so I, I'm living in Bangkok since 18 years you know? old. But then again, traveling a lot, going back to Europe, and now not because I'm stuck by the COVID. But uh, we have the company in Bangkok, which is the same name that the company that I had before. And I'm pushing the company. I'm helping my daughter the most that I can. I'm doing the transmission. And I think it's fine to be in Bangkok. You're in the middle of middle of everywhere. Africans come here. And I've been very close to Africa because I work in Africa. I work with Pakistan. So Bangkok was a natural place to be. Yeah, you have African, you have Pakistani. And currently, there yes, is yes, yes. no coronavirus. Bangkok gets yes, because uh, when I was living in Colombia, I was going to Pakistan, I was going to Afghanistan, I was going to Africa from Colombia. And it was a couple of years in 2009, I spent only 65 days, boom, in, in, in the year. The rest of the time I was traveling and in planes, in hotels. So I'm curious, you know, coming starting the business in the in the late 70s and then going into the early 80s, and now we're already more than 30 years past that time. Yes. How is it for you now when you're traveling around? Because I know you're still going to South America and you're still going to different places. How different is it now for you to be traveling, you know, just to the experience of, of you know, because you're saying if you're flying from Colombia to Africa to Bangkok, I imagine there wasn't as many flights back then or direct flights or maybe things took so much longer. No, but you still don't have direct flights from Colombia to Africa anyway. You, you, you have flight to South Africa, maybe not even that. But yes, it was a big. You have to you had to to transit through Europe if you went to Africa, mm -hmm. and even going to 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 Pakistan or Afghanistan. For me, the initial route was going through Europe, so it was okay. I did a stopover in France. I saw my 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 friends, the colleagues that I had, did some business and move on. It was natural. It was not complicated. Long long flights, long long travel routes, but okay. But you know, there's one video that maybe you can show, which is. How it was at the beginning in the extraction, in the mining thing. How the mining industry was in Colombia. How the, the whole thing started. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I exactly. So yeah, we'll see. You will see what it was back. That is between 80, 88 when I started. I mean, 70, 77, 78. I didn't go to the mine before. First time I went to the mine was like in 80, 82. I had never been there before because you couldn't go to Musso just like that. And those images are 91. So that's about nine years later. Okay. And they were still, what you know, it's like it was like the, the rush for gold. It's when it was the rush for emeralds. In in that part of Musso, Musso and Kipama, which is the same area, people call it Musso, but half of the of the land is on the Kipama municipality anyway. So they were up to 50,000 people digging 
at, in, at, at, the, at the Christmas time and at Mother Day, you had a lot of people who left the job or took vacation and they came and they wanted to try the luck because the production was open pit. So when, when it was raining, this is when they were production because they had water to reject all the debris of the explosion on the terrace down into the, the river, down to the stream. And you had between 20,000 and 50,000 people, depending on the time. When it was the rainy season and before, and the, 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 the company, the, the mine knew that they needed to feed the people. So they had what they called tambri, bigger tambri, bigger production, bigger rejection of debris at the time of Mother Day and Christmas. And, and it, it went also with the same time. Well, Christmas was normally a, a, a dry season, but a few weeks before, before the dry season came, you had a lot of chambre every, you could have several during the week, several explosion and, and people were just digging. I, I was digging there, not me, but you know, we had the water pumps and I had up to 65 guys with me with water pumps. I had five water pumps and 65 guys. And I was going every week getting, buying what they had. So it worked for one for one year, and the next six months I went even, and the next six months I started losing money. They were ripping me off. So that was the end of it. It was at the end of the. It was not even one. It was like a year and a half. Whole. And then I had I had a guy of that I trusted that went every week, and I was going every two weeks. Then I were, after that I was going every month, because I don't I don't like to live in, in, in you know in that duty. I'm like it's not it's not nice. It's nice to do it. It's nice to build it. But this is not what I wanted to do. And then I, but if you're not one of a kind to live in those streams with this person all the time or come every week, every week, it's better to get out of it because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, but it was a nice experience. So I, I was a miner in, in Musso. <laughs> Were you so, able to find some good stone? Yes, of course. I, yeah, of course, of course. Oh. But didn't myself know. They found it, you know, with, with, my, with the water pump that I was paying for. Okay. Yes. And, and so in that video, but they didn't send everything to me. I mean, they were supposed to send everything to me, but I'm sure they did not. Yeah. At the beginning, they did, or maybe at the end, not. Yes. That yes. Was... At the beginning, they did. At the end, whoever they were not finding anything. So in the video that we just saw, how how is how are the miners organized? Who, you know, do they just get get to have whatever they find, or or what? How does yes, it work? Yes. 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 They may have sponsors. You know, you see they are fighting behind the bulldozer because they had to take a position, the better, because the bulldozer was pushing back the debris. So it was opening the debris to the side and probably pushing the stones in the, in, in, in the riverbed. So they had to be the, 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 the first, if they believed that being just behind the bulldozer, they had a better chance. And yeah, there yeah. was some big, big yeah, fight, yeah. very big fight, you know. But, you know, what is really funny is that I, Estimates at the time said that 30% of the production was coming from the debris, 30, 35%. I mean, the, the mine has never been able to control everything because there was no salary paid. So people who work in, in the tunnels, of course, they got some kind of sharing of whatever they could put in their pockets without being seen. It was tolerated. This is the way it worked. Yeah. Now, if a, if a stone of a big, big amount went off the mine and they heard about it, they they found the guy and say, we want to buy it back from you. And they'd buy, they'd buy it back from you. They, they wouldn't want that to, but they were trying to get all the good stuff back when they could. Yeah. And so, so who, it was, who owns the, the land? This land belongs to the government. So they're just, I mean, this, I mean, no, 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 let me explain. Yeah, yeah, this, the land, the land, I mean, the, the subsoil in Colombia belongs to the government. So you have to pay a rent to the governments if you want to exploit the, any minerals. But the land itself, the, the, I mean, the, the farm, that belongs to the owner, a title. You have a title, you own the farm, or you own the title, but you need to license if you want to, to dig it. So you may have people who have the capital or who have the knowledge who come to see you, say, I'll put the capital, I'll put the knowledge, you have the land, I think that you have emeralds in the land, you sell it to me, or we're going to partnership. Okay. So, you know, but the land belongs to, and the land we you're seeing there belonged to, to the, to, well, what, what is today Musul, the Musul company. It was, this part was called the Las Animas, which is very, very famous. And, and this is uh, MTC, what it's the land, it's part of the land. It's not producing anymore, but, but, but it's, it's got a big, big production. 
But of course, by doing this, uh, they scrapped the mountains up and down. So you had big mountains, and I remember seeing the different the difference of level from the mountains because they were scrapping, exploding, and scrapping, and scrapping, and exploding. They were retaining the water from the from from the rain into mm -hmm. natural natural tanks, and Every now and then, they would let the water go with the push of the bulldozers, and the water would carry the debris down to the to the stream. That is how it works. And you could see the bulldozer. I had some video, but I could not upload them showing the bulldozer pushing the debris. Okay. So that's very interesting. So that's you know this is what happened in Colombia. But I think in Africa you didn't have any mining yet. In these times, well, emeralds in Africa, no emeralds. There was a little bit in the. There was a little bit in Zambia. Zambia was discovered, I think, in the 1950s, near at the end of yeah, the Yeah, but nobody, nobody was talking. There was no production coming. Whatever came was going to Jaipur secretly, probably. You know, you know what the definition of a gem dealer is? A gem dealer is a secret person who buys from a secret place at a secret seller at a secret price and sends it secretly to a secret market, sell it to a secret vendor at a secret price and put it in a secret account. <laughs> this is what a gem dealer was. What is the closest to a gem dealer? I say a drug dealer. So yeah. things must change, of course. I mean, first the name dealer should be taken up. This is a horrible name. People mm. today are Obviously, sourcing right. experts, merchants, or whatever, but not dealers. This is finished. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just like when you sell carpet, there's no price. You get the carpet from the guy you know behind the mountains, and you sell it to the guy in the other side of the herds who know nothing about carpet. That was more or less what it was. Yeah. So, so Africa was not a source for any colored stones. It was a source for diamond. Everybody knew there were diamond big mines in diamond. Not only big mines, mines small, artisanal, whatever. But none know nothing from colored stone at this time. So Colombia was a big place. If we told colored stone, emerald was very big. Ruby where? But from Burma, from Asia. So you had two poles: Asia and and South America. Brazil with the colored stone. Famous for color stone, very, very famous, big, big, and Colombia. And that was it. You had more or less the world. And you had opals coming from, uh, sorry about the Australians, if they listen to us tonight. Of course, opals were coming from Australia, but no opals in Africa at this time. And so when we're, when we're talking about, you know, these days, late 70s, early 80s, after the mining was happening, what was the actual um, pathway for the stones to get into the market and get to the final customer? Well, the, but the rough was sold. The, the rough changed hands at the mine site. And it was brought up to Bogota. There was a open street market or even going to the offices, trying the rough. And you buy the rough and you send it cut with cutters or you had your own cutters. Initially, you had to send it to people who cut for you. There was a lot of cutters in, in Bogota, thousands of cutters. They would do a service cutting, you know, because you had access and you had access to a lot of material. So the, the access to the material increased with the Emerald War. There was an Emerald War that started, it started probably in uh, 1983, 84, after the murder of a big king, uh, a big important man from Coast West, who was supposedly involved in the drug trafficking. He was murdered anyway. So that declared, that, that, that triggered a big war between Musso and Coast West. And, and Musso wanted to take over Coast West. Coast West wanted to defend themselves. Uh, they were allied to the people in the Medellin area, so it became a big, big thing. And then there was a lot of dead people. It, it lasted until 91, when they signed a treaty, and the treaty was signed through the church yeah. by the because. the bishop of uh, bishop of of Tikinkira at this time. Yes, and you see the big, the small story about that is that one of the of of the white warriors called he was called El Colmillo. He was from uh, El, 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 no, it was not El Colmillo, was he? His, 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 his brother, what is the name of his brother? Uh, uh, anyway, Luis Murcia is his name. He told me the story himself that he went one night, he went to Chiquinquila, but you could not take the road because the road were blocked with enemies. Everybody was blocking everybody. So they had moves, moves that had been trained to take, to take the tracks, mountain tracks during the night. So they go on the moor, you know, they would, get themselves on the mule and they just let the mule go up to track. And there was all night travel up to Shikinkira Plateau. And the guy arrived five o'clock in the morning, he rang at the Arab bishop door and he said, Luis Mursa, I'm here to talk peace. And that's, that's what the story told me. So uh, 
is 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 Riz Murcia is is name is the Pekinese, El Pekinese. You know, Pekinese means yeah. the you know the, the dog, the dog from Pekin Pekin was yeah, and because he was a short guy, he's still he's still alive, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I think he's still alive. And he was he was living in Cosquez in a retreat. I, I was going to Cosquez in this time because you could get very good deal. Also difficult to go because everybody was blocking everybody. But the people in Cosquez was kind of more open, and Cosquez was producing a lot. You had four big families producing emeralds. And if and you you could buy it because they need money to finance the war, so there was I've never seen as many emeralds during the war, from both sides, mm-hmm. but the war was very 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 bad, very very bad, mm-hmm. but good for business. So then stones were getting cut there, and then where do they go? Yes. Well, they were okay. So like I said, initially the big market was uh, uh, Japan. And then America, United States was second market. Then after that, you had Europe. Uh, Europe, you had France. The biggest, if you look into the airport imports, the biggest importers of, of Colombian emeralds was Switzerland. Hmm. And I think today it's not far from being still one of the biggest importers of gemstone because Switzerland was a free port. And this is where all the rich people also from the Gulf, all the rich families were sorting the top gemstone that he needed. And of course you had the top jewelers and dealers and, 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 and well, sorry about that, merchants uh, uh, with shops in, uh, in Switzerland. So in Switzerland has a reputation of being the place where it's, you know, it's safe, this is where the money can be sent, transferred, whatever. At this time it was true. So uh, this was one of, and it, the, the, the goods did not remain in Switzerland, but they transited through Switzerland. So in terms of uh, export, Switzerland was a big, Italy was a big market. Italy was a very big market. Italy was manufacturing a lot of, uh, of, of, of jewelry, exporting many places, and they had that skill, the design, and, and, and the Italian market was consuming. They were not buying maybe the top, top, top quality, but Bulgari, you know, Bulgari is an Italian house. It's a little older than that, but you had many others. You had Leo Petit, you had many, many other houses that, that were growing big at this time. And they love color. Italians love color. So Italian where it was very good for Emil, very, very good for Emil. But of course, it, then it, it disappeared after that it changed. So Europe was big because of Italy, because of France, because of, uh, of Switzerland. And Germany. But Germany, people didn't talk too much about Germany. Germany was growing stronger and stronger and stronger because it became the strongest of all. Uh, and America, uh, United States was the big, 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 big market, of course. And Japan, like I said, Japan and Korea. Bangkok, I mean, Thailand became a market when, when, when you saw the manufacturing and, and, uh, and the skill developing in Thailand. When Thailand started to have the skilled uh, uh, labor with the installation of foreign designers and foreign manufacturers who came in, in partnership here in Thailand and started manufacturing because the labor was cheaper. And it was a place when you could get all the ruby you wanted, all the sapphire you wanted, all the colors, not necessarily emeralds. But then this is when the emeralds started to come to Bangkok because in, in, in Thailand you had a demand because of the factories. Yeah. And then it became a place also for emeralds. And it became a place for everything, for diamond. You had, you know, cutting factories of diamonds in Thailand, in the north, everywhere. I think not, there are not that many anymore, but they were doing melee because the, the, the industry was using so much melee for export that they had some, some big, big uh, cutting factories before China. So that's, that is the evolution of, uh, I'm saying the emerald which I live, but this is how it interacted with the rest of the world. This is how the industry was more or less distributed at the time. Okay, and so this is why now, for example, there are some uh, uh, people told me that there are some a lot of emerald from the old days that went to Japan that are available now in the Japanese market because the people who oh, bought in the yes, yes. And, are dying now, yes. and all these emerald are coming back. And what is interesting is that emerald that were bought before eighty uh, to nineteen eighty four had only a little oil. I mean, the treatment were really fun. You know, the first treatment that I saw. You know, people took it was not, not a bottle, well, a bottle of, 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 of glass, a glass, glass bottle, or a, or, a, or what you use for laboratory. They put a little baby oil or shader oil. They started with it. Mm-hmm. They put the stones into it. 
they hit it at the flame and the first bubble, they took it not to burn the stone. And that was it. That was the only treatment. Then after that, they figured out that if they could tap it, it would be better because, uh, and then they put it, uh, you know, the, the, the syringe for injection for horses to do some vacuum mm. through, through the, the, the cork. That's super simple. And then was, then came, yes, and that was the number two thing. And then after a few months, a guy invented a metal tube with, with, a, with, a, with a screw thing that, you know, and, and, and a little valve. And then you went to the, to, the, uh, to the gas station, and instead of putting it into your tie, you put pressure into the tube. And you go home, and you put it into your uh, wa uh, boiling water onto your stove. And you control the, you control the heat not to, to go too far. And you were just heating the oil to, to, to make it uh, thinner. And, and get and get under 600 psi, very very low pressure, moving into the stone. Mm -hmm. So it was the first treatment. Mm -hmm. Then it became developed by big laboratories. And there is one little video that uh, that I have. If we can push it, and we yeah. can show uh, yeah. what it was. And then I will I will then we will talk about laboratories how the laboratories became. So this is what you see is a little bag where you put the emeralds because you put emeralds from different people and you don't want them to knock against each other and you want to recognize who they belong to. So they are put into, what he's doing here is cleaning the stone after the cutting. He's putting into acid and he will do some vacuum into the acid. Okay, so that was back then, you know, and, and then, but well, he's still doing the same thing with a little more modern equipment. And then he's doing some, he's, he's, he's taking out the gas of the, of the, He's taking out. He's doing a vacuum for the reaction of the of, of the acid into the into the, the glass, heating a little bit. Okay, and then that was the first step. And the, the second step, they were doing the. You will see the vacuum, but into a into a into a autoclave, like they mm. were doing in Brazil. You know, in Brazil, when I was going to Brazil selling rough at the time, they were putting all the rough into autoclave. They were putting into opticon into resin, but, you know, the laboratory from use, uh, the Opticon. And, and then because it was consolidated, the, frac the fissures into the rough and they could cut it. And nobody said anything to the Brazilian that they were putting some resin into it. And so you see, this is the tube, bigger tube. So it goes with oil. He took it off. He put the pressure in, they clean it and it's, it's done. So the, the whole thing is from one day to another. It's, you know, so he's putting the pressure. Uh, so so cool. the video has been mounted. Uh, it, it, should, it should have been seen before, but you understand yeah, the process. They were doing that on custod. They what? were doing like that on custod. At these times, they were doing on a faceted stone. Ah, yes, yes, yeah. correct, 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 correct. Well, yeah, okay, correct. So the, 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 the interesting story about that is that in 84, I remember the guy, because I knew the guy, they started coming to the office and said there was a new oil that had the same refractive index, much better than the shadow oil, and it was lasting longer. They said, this is palm oil. Oh, palm oil. It was transparent. And they had it in, you know, those, uh, those Nescafe bottles? Mm -hmm. So it was a container of Nescafe, and it was $200 for a Nescafe bottle. I paid, everybody paid, because it was really giving a fantastic result. So we put them into the tube that you see. We emerged the, the stone into it, put it into pressure. Beautiful. And it was this transparent, good, shining, very nice. And everybody was buying a palm oil. And the Brazilians, when I was going to Brazil with the Russ, hey, guys, you're using what palm oil? Don't you, why don't you bring palm oil the next time? Because we only use Optigon and your palm oil is better. So I remember taking palm oil <laughs> Selling it for five hundred dollars the bottle in Brazil to to Afranio to the people you know people that still some are, some are still in the business now and and then uh, and then we discovered not until uh, 95, 94, when we started seeing that there was a change in the stone that they became yellow sometimes you know in the fissures or sometimes you you could see some crack opening or sometimes you can see some dark spot coming into the stone. What happens with this? And there was maybe uh, Vincent, you knew uh, Professor Zucchini, Zucchini, who was um, a professor in uh, in in in, uh, in 
uh, where they make the the trains in uh, Belfort, not in Belfort, in uh, around these places in east of France, while he was in Egypt. I forget the name of the city. No, 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 Mul no, south of Mulhouse, south of Mulhouse. When no. they make uh, the trains, huh? Yeah, Belfort. No. No, not Belfort, and south or south of Belfort. I don't, it doesn't matter. Okay, it yeah. doesn't matter. Anyway, so he he, he was he, he got Belfort. interested. In, he, he he was working on 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 on. Uh, he was a professor of crystallography, an engineer of engineering, and he was teaching crystallography amongst other things in in Besançon. 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 Yeah, Besançon. Okay. yeah Besançon. Sorry, I didn't hear. And uh, he. He got interested into that, and he started doing some. So we brought. I remember bringing some uh, some some samples to him, and we were leaving the samples on the window and with at the daylight, and see what happened over one month, two months, three months. And Emmanuel, I, I brought some also to Emmanuel to note, and we were trying to find out what was happening. So just putting any stones, bath them, I mean, have them treated, and 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 up, and just looking at what was happening, and we saw that they were oxidizing with the sun, with the light. So. The, Professor Zucchini was one of the first who said, this is resin. He, 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 he found out it was a resin and not a thyme oil. Mm -hmm. So what kind of resin was it? So what, that, that was easy because you bought the, we bought the glass and then you, you studied the resin. And we found out it was from Siba Jeji, from Shell, you know, and, and it was that the price then fell down because everybody, the world went very fast, you know, that it was a resin and not so everybody was going to the laboratory, was selling it in Bogota and buying the material. But mm. there was a big business that lasted like almost 10 years. So when the lab, and this is how the lab became very strong because before that date, the labs were only saying it was a genuine or not a genuine stone. People went to a gem lab to ask if it was a true stone or a, or a fake stone or a, or a synthetic stone. That's the there is only what- the Synthetic, similar, or metal. That was it. There was no, there was no more to it. And then you have gemology studying the inclusion. People are always curious and going further. But the public and the business for a lab was just saying, good, no good. But then became what was happening in Asia with the heating, with the healing, and with the treatments in Colombia. Except that in Colombia, Colombians kept saying, this is palm oil. This is pine oil and pine oil. And then we only put cedar oil. And if somebody put pine oil, it's because you do it when you leave the country. Because when it is in Colombia, it's only pine oil. It's only cedar oil. So if, any, any, if you find cedar oil in a laboratory, it is because somebody else has changed the treatment. Believe, no believe. This was, let's say it's a legend. This is what it was. Okay. So, but this really put the laboratory into research and into developments. And they understood that there was a business in, let's not call it certification, because I know you don't like the word, it's, it's, and it's a report, <laughs> because it was a certificate until they had some legal trouble and certification that was not a real certificate. So they don't want to take a risk, now they call that a report, but it has the value of a certificate. If you don't have this piece of paper, you cannot make the sale. And this is yeah. a real thing for con consumer confidence. And it, it, it even holds in, in a court of law. But there's no responsibility for a lab. It's only... Yeah. This is what I say to all people who say uh, certificate. I say, if you say certificate, it means that you certify something. So then you are liable if there is something wrong. And uh, labs uh, write very clearly that they are not liable. They don't issue certificates. They issue reports. But people in the trade still use the word certificate on certificate and uh, somewhere this is dangerous because one day if uh, somebody cheats somebody else if you say on writing that you issue you have a certificate you can be uh, accused of uh, you know complicity of uh, you know uh, cheating complicity and things like that um, I'm not sure because it's written it's written in small letters but it's still written on, on, on what is what the trade calls third it is written that it's only a report he said it's a it's a gem testing report, and he yeah, said, "Yeah, you are a gem merchant. Based, if you are, based on the best observation, report. we believe that this is this." But if if you yeah, are, for example, a gem merchant, and you put on your invoice that there is a certificate from that, and the word said, I, I, "I'm a, I was a bit, you know, when I started my career, 
you had the story with Metrale and the ruby in Paris with yeah. the carrot and things like that. So then I started to be very, very careful about everything that I say, because even with the word carrot on a lab report, Metrale on the lab in Paris had some problem. So you have, as a lab or as a gemologist or even as a gem merchant, you have no idea if you put something in writing, yeah. what may happen two or three years later. Yeah, well, France is a complicated country anyway, but but thank, uh, calling sort of everybody selling stones or high hem piece of jewelry every day. And today the market is for that high end or low end. And I've seen sales, I've been involved in sales recently of pieces that go over $10 million, big things. Mm -hmm. And before they even look at the, at, at the stone, they want to see what they ask, what certificate, what certificate, what Never. this is not what report, what certificate, everybody, the investor, everybody. So it has the value of a certificate and it's not a certificate, I agree with you, but it has the value. If you don't have that, there's no business. Even in the, low, in the low end, because the consumer now, for any three, four, five thousand dollars that he invests, they, they start asking for a certificate. And not in the US as much, but, but yes, it's, you know, it, because stone at five thousand dollars end up at a, at a piece of jewelry for twenty five thousand dollars, probably, or even more. So, An independent third party lab report. Okay, you are, this is what it is, but you know, let's not kid ourselves. It's, uh, it's, but it's, it's a little bit long. Yeah. People like to shorten seeing everything. So instead of saying independent right. uh, third party uh, report, they say certificate, which is dangerous on a legal point of view. Yeah. That's well, what, I what, is, what, has, what has really changed in the industry is that today people don't sell stones, they sell certificate. Sorry to say that again. They sell papers. They, because, you know, before you even go to a deal or even look at a stone, they say, do you have a six carats certified, say six carats SACF, you know, this is what people talk. They talk in terms of grad graduation into this report, into the origin of the certificate. And that is what is making the value of the stone before they want even to look at the stone. So this is how the industry has changed. And this is how the laboratory business has evolved. And our, bat our battery has become very, very important. I think that this is a kind of controversial uh, use of, uh, you know, lab report than to call them certificate when they are not certificate. But, no, okay. but it's I, understand the problem. I, I understand people should look more at the stone than to look at the paper associated with the stone. I agree. Uh, I totally agree with that. And there are some people, yeah, they look at the paper and then maybe they will look at the stone and some people don't even look at the stone. So... Yeah, no, I know. they don't know. I mean, yeah. this is not the first thing people look in the trade, in B2B, in a certain level of, 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 of stones. People talk in minor, moderate, uh, heated, non heated, distant, blah, 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 you know? And in, in talking to origin, and they talk about names and names that have to be on who put the name on what paper. And if you have that, then okay, we can do business. This is what makes the initial attraction. And then they look into the rest. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the gem trade. When it's yeah. into a piece of jewelry, if the piece of jewelry is made by a luxury house or by a rec recognized and famous designer, there's no question about it. Even though a Asian people can st still ask for a search. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been, you know, there have been stories in France where rich people from China were buying from Cartier or from Bouchon and they wanted a GRS certificate because they wanted it to say pigeon blood from GRS. So this is a true story. And GRS opened a lab in Paris because of this. They have a lab in Paris because they have a market because there is a comment on that. Part of the, <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is the business of certification. Sorry to say that, or report. So it has become, this is something new. You didn't have that 30 years ago. Now it's no, no, very big. I agree. I, I very, started very gemology. Big. I started gemology in 2001. And uh, then there was, for me, treatment. It's, uh, when I studied gemology, the treatment thing was uh, well established and things like that. And I was surprised when I was speaking with people like you, you know, uh, old timers, like I say, they told me, yeah, you know, Vincent, 10 or 20 years ago, we were not putting a treatment on the report. 
No. Wow, what a shock. No. You know, I, I learned that some uh, very major lab were not uh, using treatment in the report until the end of the 1990s. So there are some lab reports, if you look at them, and they are data uh, at the end of the 80s or beginning of the 90s, there is no information on the, about treatment because at this time, it was not in their uh, normal procedure to, uh, to check for treatment. So yeah, there was a, an incredible evolution regarding a lab report and regarding the trade in the past 50 years. And, and it might continue. That is uh, something that is both uh, fascinating and scary. Because there is no reason yes. thing will stop. Okay. Well, so the here's... bottom line, the bottom line is that the conclusion about the labs is that today the gem and jewelry business cannot live without certs. Sorry about that. <laughs> Everything has to be certified. And because we have the consumer confidence that has changed, people yeah. want to know what they're buying and they want to be third party certified. Yeah. You know, they want third party make sure on insurance, third party insurance. And that report that you call, it gives an insurance enough for people to invest their money. I know some people don't like the, the word investment, but when you buy a piece of jewelry, you still, you're still doing an investment, no matter what, what you call it. Not because you're gonna make a profit when you sell it, but you're investing. Like when you buy a, a car, even if you car, you're gonna sell your car, have the price of your board, you still invest in a car. So investing in jewelry is investing in jewelry. And it so would uh, it would be interesting to see if one day there will be actually really a lab who will start to certify something. That would be interesting. We don't, it doesn't matter. This is just a this is just matter of word, call it whatever you want. The process is like that. And the consumer doesn't want to hear about a report. The consumer wants a certificate. He wants insurance. He wants to make sure that the guy who said him the thing. Use the right word that will help make the sale. And those papers help make the sale. And they also give the sufficient confidence to the customers not to run away because they've heard so many things. They've read so many things in the press. So today, deontology and ethics call for full disclosure. And the industry has gone into full disclosure. This is something that is mandatory by law. If you don't full disclose, you can be taken to the court because then you have make a false statement and you have been uh, cheating your customer. So it's like committing a robbery. So that, that did not exist. You can, you can have the, this did not exist 30 years ago. Yeah. Because so, there was no court that could rule. Yeah. Today, you have the so called reports that are taken by the judge at a certificate that can, you know, can rule, make the difference. So one question from the audience came up about this. What about, what, and what do you guys can both ha have a say at this is, uh, what about uh, whenever you have conflicting opinions from different reports on the same stone, from different labs, I mean? Well, yes, this is a big, big problem. This is a big, big problem because problem. you can understand what? that harmonization, even though we, I, I would love, I've been, I've been, advocating for harmonization between the labs and they have even that they have laboratory laboratory harmonization committee no matter what they call it what they have they will never harmonize because if they're in business you know you can just do the same thing as the other guy you must be better if not you lose a customer to the other lab so you must have a better thing a better way but being together on the same page because the business is it's a big pie that you need to distribute between all the labs also true and you have some that are better in finding new processes that are serving the customer, consumer, serving the trade. When you're in the lab, you need to serve two clients, two, two markets. The consumer that needs to start asking for the thing that you can provide, the service, and, and the trade, because they're the ones who are going to pay for it. So they are the customers. You need to make it hard enough and compulsory enough and mandatory enough to have all of them coming and ask for a cert. I mean, sorry, for a report, for a service. And then when you have that, you have a business. And then you need to develop your business, show that you're better than the other one. You provide better report, better study, better whatever. And find also new things to talk about because this is the way it is. And it's, it's perfectly, it's perfectly uh, acceptable. And more than acceptable, it is necessary. So, yeah, you, but, you know, the, the thing is, there is one thing that is very simple about that is, what is the definition of a lab? There is no there is no worldwide uh, you know uh, like a, 
doctors where you need to have a degree like that, like that, in order to establish yourself as a doctor. Anybody no. can open a lab. A lab is a company. You're right. Customers. So You're right. when if people you think if about you... labs, there are labs. There is not even a geologist working in the lab. So there is if lab and lab. To... Yes. Yeah, That's true. If you go to Sri Lanka, and I know we have people from Sri Lanka listening tonight, if you go to Berwala or if you go to even Colombo, you have tens of labs. And yeah. in, in, in Ratnapura, for, for one simple reason, for one simple reason, that, and this is something that is a problem in the industry, when you are a young gemologist, when you go to study gemology in any school, and if you want to do something after, what is what can you do? You can work for a company, okay. You can maybe open a school, but to open a school, you need a big investment, a stone to give to your thing, or you can open a lab. And actually, the easier to do is to open a lab. So, uh, because a lab, you just need to have customers, people coming, and you give your opinion about a stone. So, opening a lab is very easy, even if you don't have instrument. As long as you have customer, you open a lab. And as long as you have customers yeah. on your profit profitable, your lab is running, but there are lab and lab. In some labs, there are honest people with good instrumentation, with a good qualification and things like that. And in other labs, you don't have that. So people say the lab, the lab. Yeah, but you have to look at which lab against which lab. Do they have the same type of instrument, the same type of technique, the same type of thing? It's going from zero to yeah. whatever. Hmm. Uh, That's the difficulty. Maybe. I understand. I understand the problem. I totally understand. In 2006, the maybe you read it. I published a World Laboratory Directory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I listed. If you go into it, I listed every small lab that I could find somewhere, mm -hmm. because they were they were giving a service. A lab is more uh, somebody or a group of people who give a service what it's needed. And where do we have so many so-called labs? In, in Berwala or in Ratnapura or in uh, Islamabad or uh, even in even in, in Peshawar is because people need to know even in the in the local commerce because you have a lot of people that are not knowledgeable enough to know in, what if it's either or not because it's, it's so there are, those are trading places trading places when it changed it's changed people make money on business on trade and and then but at a certain point of, of they need to put their money and send it to somebody who's going to ask the right question. So they need to know. So the guy who knows what the other one wants to know collects some money and he provides a service. Now, call it a lab. They call themselves laboratory because they give they give a conference by calling themselves laboratory. But they're providing a service, and I think I will, this is totally normal. Totally I will okay. Tell you a story. I will tell you a story. You know, I was a director of a lab, and I was sent a stone. I was, I was at EHGS at this time. I was sent a stone and I identified the stone as a synthetic spinner. And then the customer came back and complained because he has a report from another lab saying that the stone was natural. So I check against the stone and we hold on our report that the stone was a synthetic. Then he returned to the other lab and then one hour later, I get a phone call from the other lab and asking us how we did uh, found that the stone was synthetic. We explained them. And then they found out that they made a mistake. And then that they didn't know that there was this type of synthetic spinner. So what happened, the customer was very angry because he bought the spinner as natural based on the report from the other lab. And, uh, you know, and then he found out that the stone was synthetic. So then he was very angry. And what uh, the other lab did, they said, okay, we cannot give you back the money for the stone. We cannot uh, take responsibility for that. But they gave, the, the other lab gave to the customer the equivalent of the value of the stone in report from their lab. So we were right and we lose a customer for two years because that customer had $10,000 value of report from our competitor. And from that day, you know, he used all his, uh, you know, he went to the other lab and he get report for free, even if the other lab, you know, made a mistake. So that day I learned that even if you do the right thing as a lab director, it doesn't mean that you will keep your customer. So it's a very tricky oh, thing. People go for papers. They need the paper to make the cell. And the so, labs don't, the problem, Vincent, is that the lab don't give a constant opinion. Even same lab can change an opinion on the same tone they've seen again. It happens. And between labs, they get different opinions. And well, even the and, same lab can make it. Well, and sometimes, I have seen that uh, several times, sometimes, uh, you know, something happened to the stone between the twice, the two times the stone is submitted. Uh, well, I, 
Okay. Yes, that. okay. This, I have seen that. This is always, yes, this is maybe, maybe, maybe not. This is always what the lab will say anyway, because labs are never wrong. No, Labs no, no. I, I, well, it, I don't say that lab are never wrong, you know. Lab, uh, Vincent, you're, but, Vincent, you're a field gemologist. Don't become a lab man. Stay a field gemologist. I like you better as a field gemologist. So uh, listen, I'm a lab guy. The, <laughs> the, industry, the industry has changed also yeah. because uh, it has changed because you have the consumer confidence, but you have also the, the mistrust and, and the confusion about which lab to go? I need a lab with SCCF because it sells better. Or Gublin because in that market, Gublin has a better name. Or I mean, AIGS because they're rated cheaper and AIGS giving good reports. And that's what I need for my customers. This is how people are just thinking. And at the end, if you, you go to a end up customer as a consumer who is educated and aware of, because he buys high value merchandise, he's the one who will ask you for the I mean. For for this for the report, same as in the auction, they 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 put they put the they put the the, the, the pieces in the auction, but they want to check what certificate it has, and some they will say, oh, this is not enough, get another one. For that kind for this kind of 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 piece, with like some you know, and and they have to go for two or for three certificates, which and and today this is what is making the business. We are we must go through this, and. Consumer confidence is very important, and the tools of the lab is also important because it forces people to disclose, it forces people to have a, a behavior, I mean, the best behavior possible, and it gives a third-party verification for the consumer. And this is what the industry needs, third-party verification. Yeah. So that leads us to something else, which I will come later on, and the, and the last and the end of the, of the talk, I will address this, I mean, certification at another level, mm -hmm. ethics, which is, of course, the evolution of the industry. We didn't have this before. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I said in a while ago, the definition of the de of, of, of a gem dealer, this is not possible anymore mm -hmm. because the, the technology is coming, the legality, the formalization is coming, and you need to be transparent, and, and, and the, the chain will shorten. Next, it will be shorten because if you don't supply, if you don't provide a value, if you don't add a value to the product, you will disappear because they will see where you come to. I mean, they will end up seeing where it comes from because you have to disclose somehow. I mean, it, the time that you buy from a secret source and sell to a secret source, I think this is finished or it will be finished very, very soon because of the tra traceability, because of the blockchain thing. Even if we like it or not like it, it's coming. And this is a technology that I is see. going to be applied I and we change the whole thing. Globalization but, technology are changing a lot of things. Globalization. Of course it is. The, no. the, the goods are moving from no. one place to another one where you have different standards, different things, and now you have technology. And uh, yeah, this is uh, really uh, changing a lot of things, both for the lab and the trade. I understand, you know, both of us, you know, people in the lab, people in the trade have a lot of challenge, and it's very difficult to, to uh, make everything perfect. I will say that. Yeah. Now we, we we were talking the, about the labs and and the certs about treatments and about the contents, but now the next thing is the origin. And now everybody wants to know an origin, and the labs have become the magician of origin. Now they know because chemistry, I mean, they have technology that you know because they have database that are good enough to to make sure that they can compare the origin. Yeah, well, I know you will if you you haven't sold them your samples, you will believe they don't have the right database. I understand that too, but some of them believe they do. So and you, you're right. You may better if you go to the mine and get the sample, but sometimes you can get the sample from a source that you don't have to get in the mine. Uh, yeah, and you have the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Okay. So anyway, origin has become a very, very important thing because the consumer wants to know the provenance. They want to make sure it comes from a reputable, ethical, legal, not at war, and uh, acceptable source. So whenever there's something happening in Myanmar, you have part of the world who doesn't want to buy anything from Burma. Yeah, but- Wrong, see, wrong, wrong, or not, wrong or not wrong. This is where origin is so important. It becomes important, it becomes a, a political factor, and it becomes a very big economical factor. 
yeah. because you have people who believe that poor guys, I don't want to buy from a guy who is helping these guys or a war country or are using some children. And I want to discuss what, what is the age for the children mm. in a mine or not, mm. not without discussing that. People say, okay, I don't want because this is not my culture. So I'm punishing this culture because they don't do my culture. Basically, this is it. But the, this is how the origin has become important. So this is another very important thing in the industry that you cannot live without. And today, we're not only talking about the country of origin. People are putting the mind. Because now if you, we, you know, we sell, we sell, we, we sell uh, spinel. We don't sell spinel from Vietnam. You sell spinel from Lukian. You don't spare him. You don't sell him from Colombia. You sell him from Puso. Bison or because <laughs> Lukian is bigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but, no, 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 but no, wrong, no. Or, wrong or not wrong, you have those appellation of origin yeah. that are tied to region of villages. Sometimes wrongly. Mm. Sometimes it's wrong. Because you know, Muso, Muso is one little part. You have a Pekama, you have all the parts, you have all the Rio Minero, and, and, and it's okay. But but a place can become an origin and it becomes a trade origin. Become and today people want to become see, they brand. want to hear about mining. Hey, when you talk about you say Mehenge, you don't say Tanzania. People say Mehenge Spinner. They don't say Tanzania. They say Mehenge. Yeah. They say Longino. Everybody yeah. talks in the names of the mine. This is new. It did not exist. Even five years ago, it did not exist. So, yeah. and this is where we're going. So the knowledge that the industry is, is claiming and is providing as an information to the consumer is more and more narrow. I wouldn't I don't know if accurate, but it's more and more precise in detail. And I mean, understandably enough, the consumer wants to know more because they want to understand environment, they want to understand political situation, if, if there is, they want to understand if they are employed, if they are women or no women, I mean, in all the genders, which is making the business of NGOs anyway. But these, these things are all, this all goes together. So, but, but, but this is, is important. Somewhere this is insane because many of the stone uh, stone are durable. So you have many stone in the trade, like for example, Burmese rubies, they were not mined the in the past five years, they were mined maybe 200 or 300 years ago. So the political situation today in Burma have nothing to do with the stone, you know, left the Burma at the time of the British or at the time of the Burmese king. So this is where this system somewhere is not adapted to our product. Because I understand that this, uh, you know, a fair trade and things like that, is very well adapted to banana, to coffee, and things like that, to agricultural products that are, you know, what you consume today is produced basically today. But gemstones are durable products. And in many cases, the situation today in the country have nothing to do with, uh, you know, uh, the stone because they were mined 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. No, I understand like, that. We're, 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 the emerald, I the emerald understand that, that we're, are we're not in Japan, that were mined in Colombia during the 70s or something like that. The situation in Colombia today have nothing to do with some, most of the emeralds, of the beautiful emeralds from Colombia you have in the trade. Some of them are maybe coming from the Spanish. No, so I, I understand. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a criteria that is coming from the agriculture or from maybe the cotton industry that poison somewhere the, the brain of the final consumer because they want to know the origin, because they want to know if the miner was well paid and things like that. This is not adapted to our product because our product, gemstone by definition, are durable. And also, yeah. the thing is the lab, we have some uh, very strong limitation and already giving the origin country is difficult. So giving the mine is nearly impossible. But so Vincent, it's, the it's, a very, of, a it's a very big issue because if I may say something, I will I will say what I think. I mean, consumers are who decide; they are the one who invest. We are in the capital capitalist world. You have people who put their money, and if they decide because it's fashionable, because it's a trend, because they believe, because religious, whatever, that this is bad. This is it, my man. You you finished. You can say this is not adapted or adapted. This is the consumer who decides, and they decide by what they read, what they see, what they hear. So we have the to educate the consumer about our product. Yeah, but 
Of course, you have to educate that, but you, but you cannot. I mean, whatever happens in one country or another, you cannot educate. This is a sentiment, and the consumer has sentiment, and you need to go. You want to drive through the sentiment, and labs are providing tools that protect you against sentiment. And origins is something, of course, that is important because this is how you you can have the possibility for countries and for regions to brand themselves because they did not even exist before. I mean, who knew that in Nigeria, there were gemstone and colored stone like 15 years ago, nobody knew about it. Today, you start talking about Nigeria, well, not yet about origin of, of mining, even though there are in, in the trade and people who know about the tourmaline trade and, and think they know, they talk about Abuja leather, they talk about Mambila for the Safar. So there's some of the local names are popping up. Mm. But even the country, and today the they start organizing their the trade, the internal trade. People will understand where it's coming from, and they will start using it because it is it's good for business. Also, it is good to brand and to sell something that you you can say it is come from my village or from whatever, and people like to know that. But you have to prove that mm. it's provenance. So this is the next business for the laboratory: proof of provenance. Gublin is very strong in that. And this is where the technology comes, when you have all the... Yes, uh, again, you know. again, again, this is only okay for stone that will be mined tomorrow, but this is not applicable for the stone that were mined yesterday, or 100 years ago, or 200 years ago. Well, this is true, but it's a, it's a little detail. I mean, we need to live the day to day life, and the industry needs to survive and grow tomorrow. And the day after, and the month after, and the next after. Today, everybody is worried with what is happening with the industry because the industry is taking a big blow. If you have looked at the, yeah, the stock really? exchange over the last two years, the last two days, all the luxury houses are plunging because their results are, of course, much lower than they were, and mm -hmm. it's affecting the value on the stock exchange. Nobody believed that could happen. It is happening because it's happening. It's hitting everybody. So. In the trade, we are, because we are all gemstone people. I mean, we're all jewelry people. But before the jewelry, you have the gem. The gem is a, is a raw material. It goes into a piece of jewelry because people cannot eat the gems. They cannot do anything with the gems. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very tied together. But the, the challenges are pretty, pretty, pretty big. And uh, yeah, it's to it's produce it. something that people will enjoy at the end. People who want to enjoy, they want yeah. to enjoy a ring with a, a beautiful name, a beautiful story, and they don't want to hear about problem. I understand. People want to enjoy. That's why they, many people of origin, they want something that is romantic, and they want something that they will be uh, happy buying and uh, happy giving. This is what they want. So that they takes, want to yes, but that uh, takes us, yes, 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 Vincent, that takes us to the evolution of the mining and the company. 15 years, 20 years ago, you only had small, small miners and small things in the cutter stone industry. You didn't have any big, big, big operation. You had Musso, well, one of the biggest, mm -hmm. because you had Victor, it was a big mine because it had been built up by the government. You had two, well, Cosquest was a big mine, but it was closed. I mean, you had some big mines in Colombia because it had been, it had been built by the government. You had one or two big mines in, I mean, in, in Asia, in, in Burma or- You had the British in Burma, but they failed. They failed at the beginning of the yes. 20th century. They failed. Yes. They yes, but what happened is that by looking into big, you see, the, what makes the value of a gemstone is not the rarity of the stone. It's the beauty, yes, but not the rarity. The moment you have availability in quantity, there is a market because it can be used by an industry, it can be bought again, it can be planned, it can be invested on the long term, and capital industry, which are the, even the luxury, can build up ahead two, three years, because they, they don't build for, the, for, for, for two months or for next week. They, they plan for two, three years, and they need to have a constant resupply. This is the resupply. They invest in the development, they need to, this is an industry. So if, if your availability, the price will be sustainable or go up because there could be tension on the price if 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 the if if, if the demand of or the fashion goes into that direction. Okay. Correct. Now to raise not good. It, it, if you look into so what gives you this? Emerald can give you big deposit. So far, yes. Uh, Ruby certainly. So this is where you have seen investment of big companies, of 
like uh, Jan Field, let's talk about Jan Field and, 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 uh, and, and Fura, capital companies going miners, mind you, miners, not only, not only investors, not only uh, players, you know, but people who know what they're doing. Investing into the color stone because they could find deposit that has a long run, long, you know, long life, and that has a feasibility for the quality and the quantity to be sustainable and to invest the right money. You need to invest a lot of money for those things. That was not the case before. And they, they bet on, the, on, they see one thing. The diamond was very high in price. It was 10, 15 times higher than any color stone. The, the, the value of, of the diamond industry was, you had 5% of, of the color stone industry together was about five to 7% of the whole diamond industry value. So there was nothing, but it was a big, 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 big uh, opportunity to grow. So by doing the proper market, proper exploitation, investment, and marketing, and a right business plan, which Jamfield did, they, they were successful. This, and then other companies moved into the plan. You know, I'm not talking about Greenland because it's a little bit different. The story is different. But uh, but 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 Fura and other companies, Chinese companies that are operating in Africa, or other companies that have been investing also in Africa and making no noise. Canadian company also in Colombia and in other countries. They go into that because there is there is a, there is a potential now in the other stones which are not so valuable and the, the type of uh, the, the type of geology that you have which are pegmatite mainly or deposits that are not you can, you don't know the the first the value of the stone is not that much and the quantity you're gonna get in pockets is you you never know. So nobody is going to invest big money into that. You have barely Mekonos. You can have Mekonos mine, but, but medium-sized mine or for Paraiba or for some kind of, of stone that can provide enough return when you get them in certain quantity to justify an investment of that type. Most of the time, the deposit will be will have a timeline for a couple of years at, at most and sometimes a couple of months. So this is where you have all those Small miners who will move from one place to another until they deplete whatever they can have access, and nobody is going to invest to to look further or deeper because this is pegmatite and this is complicated that it's not big value and it's not of much interest. So this is why you have that difference between big mining and small artisanal small scale mining, which will always remain because all those beautiful stones that we live with today. We can talk about spinel, about tourmaline, about about uh, garnet. Don't what about jade? Deposit. What about jade? I think jade was. No, I'm not, not talking know. about jade. Jade. I'm not talking about jade. I'm working on okay. something with big shoes on jade for a next uh, in color issue, and that's a big, big things. And I have a headache on jade. So okay, okay. I'm not a very, I'm not knowledgeable <laughs> on jade. Jade is a Chinese thing. It's a Chinese mystery. It is something that is much bigger than we are. And yes. I would not it's pretend to talk on the jade. whole cornerstone industry together. I it is, it is, it is, it is. So it is something that I about diamond on, uh, there is jade in the middle. That is, I will not talk about it. Okay, I will not talk about it because I don't know about it. So that regarding was the to the part of mine, that was the first big mine I visited. I went to Pakan. I saw that. I was impressed. <laughs> in 2000. Uh, Vincent, uh, we're already talking. How long there? Uh, okay. Jesus. Okay, yeah. so. I want to. I wanted to uh, say that following the, what I was saying about the small miner, the big miners, there has been, you know, th the standards are needed. Every industry needs standards. Yep. No, the car industry. When you when you go on the street, when you go on the road, when you drive a car on a, on 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 a on a highway, the signs are almost the same everywhere in the world. You can understand a no, you know, a no entry sign, a stop sign. These these are standards. And if you want to go safely on any directions, whether it's like I say, or in a business or in a confidence or in investment, you need to have standards you can rely on. So right. the gemstone industry had no standards, need standards. Now standards that can be done, accepted, accepted, okay, achieved, achieved. But you know, Rome wasn't done in one day and, and people need to understand what standard they can take. And if you're a small guy or an operator, you need a standard, but you need to start at your level. What is wrong is imposing Occidental standards 
to other cultures that are not thinking in the same way and have different laws. Sometimes what you do in your country is illegal and it may be illegal in other countries or vice versa. And because the culture accept this and changing the culture of other people, who are we to just do that? You know, I don't think we should even go into that. I mean, ethics is not a matter of changing culture. Ethics is making sure that there is no exploitation of man by man, there is no injustice or wrong behavior. In, well, this is my thinking, uh, if, if, uh, if let me talk. And so basically, standards are needed, but standards are needed to basic rule. Of everybody agrees that you, know, you don't have forced labor, uh, this kind of thing. And I think that are really easy to define. Besides that, culture should be, and it's, I think it's much more profitable and much more uh, romantic and much more sellable and much more acceptable for a consumer when they buy a piece of jewelry with a beautiful gemstone, they get a piece of culture where it comes from. Yeah. Not that they get it from people that are dressed with Guantanamo uniform in the same kind of barracks everywhere in the world. Mm. That I don't think this is the right dimension and the right way to go because this is killing the industry. Look at what happened with the diamond. The diamond have gone to man-made diamond. Now they make laboratory diamond. They're killing themselves. And you see, every day, the lab-grown diamond industry is growing. And every day, the natural diamond industry is going down. I'm not that, No matter what. Well, I'm and that is what's going to happen. I will finish when we finish later on. And not in a few minutes, I will I will close my, my the discussion with this with this aspect. But going back to the investment, we have you see the big mines that are investing vertically, they extract, they invest big money, they need mm-hmm. all the tools possible, they need all the Dublin possible, they need all the provenance proof and the mystery uh, product to put into the thing to say we are the best, or what my product is foolproof, because this is their marketing. And they're right, if they can't control it. Right, right. But it has it has done some ha- damage to the rest of the industry because it was looking like this was the only thing that was good. All the rest was bad. And nobody made the difference between what is formalized, what is legal and illegal. Uh, if you are illegal miners, yes, because they don't have another chance, they have to be illegal. And that is a big problem. But formalization is not that complicated. It's giving a legal frame and educating people giving them a chance to do the job in the way they know and helping them to do it better mm-hmm. in their own culture mm-hmm. with really good existence and with the minimum protection and visibility, which is what the industry has not wanted to do, give visibility to the guy at the bottom. Because the more the further he is, the more visible he is, the more profit you make. And that has been the big problem. So, and... So the technology, we change that. And I think there is a consciousness, even from the luxury houses, because they are changing, they're shifting their thinking. I've been talking to them and I know they're changing. They are understanding that the small miner, they have to live with the small miner. Of course, this is not what they do when they buy ruby or when they buy maybe emerald. But when they buy so far, they still buy from small miners because there's not, no big companies yet in so far. Not yet. Close, close, close. But not yet. And so far, it comes from different ways in origin, Africa, coming through Sri Lanka, mystery, mysteriously exported back, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so far, it comes in big quantity and high prices. But the rest, and you see the prices of tourmaline, how it's gone from nothing. You have this paraiba thing. Paraiba is, is a tourmaline, a type of tourmaline. Look at the price of a paraiba. Look at the price of a red spinel from Burma. Hmm? Well, these, these, price, these stones that people are tending to call semi-precious stone. You can have a $10 piece of emerald and you can have a $1 million paraiba, easy. What is precious, what is unprecious, you know? So the thing first, I think all the stones that can be set in a piece of jewelry that are transparent and crystalline enough to resist and be on a piece of jewelry are precious. And this is the definition that was given to the stones. Now, in France, they've decided that they have fine and semi-precious and precious. That was Napoleon, uh, the taxes. Well, was, uh, Nap- Napoleon was good to do war, but it was uh, tax on the semi-precious were not tax. I think this is the difference as the origin well, between I, precious I and semi-precious. I don't know, but 
But yeah, making a law again in 2000 and 2002, this is ridiculous. I agree, anyway. I agree. I agree. What, and, what, is and, and the thing is what is English is Jean Claude is you say that the industry needs standard, but this is exactly what you were saying. Like, you know, the standard, like for example, the traceability and origin are something that are coming, I think, from a little bit from other uh, industries that are diffusing in our industry because the customer is asking for that. These are standards in other industry that are kind of contaminating our industry and suddenly, oh, customer is asking for that, so we have to do that. And uh, this, is, uh, this is challenging. This is challenging because well, there are very different situation, like a legal situation in different country. You have small company, yes. you have big company. You have, yes. uh, it's, uh, it's very complicated. The cornerstone industry yes. is very complicated. Yes, but it is doable. You know, I mean, the standard committee of the of the RGC, they've asked me to be there, and it was a big discussion in, in working on the standards. And the standards were initially very high because they had been, the, the whole thing was developed by the by the big houses and things. And yeah. then, but looking into deeply, when they started looking into what it was, and they understood, and then they were talking to the people who needs to be certified. And those people say, we cannot be certified because what the standards you're looking at, what the direction you're going, it's just not doable. Mm -hmm. And of course it's understandable. So now it's an easy thing. When you have a business, you need to know what you're doing. You need to keep track of who you buy from. You need mm -hmm. to keep track of who you sell from. And you need to know your buyer. You need to know your supplier. You need mm -hmm. to make sure the guy is doing it right and all the time and, and establish a constant business. Same with the people you sell to. So you're already doing it. It's just a matter of putting it in order. And even one business person, one business person can do, can have a code of practice, can, can establish a practice, can keep track of the practice. Not that you have to do it all the time, but it is, you put order in your house. Mm -hmm. It's basic order. You know, this is not costly. Just need to keep track. Everybody needs an accounting. Okay. Everybody needs to do. Okay, this is the best thing. Things nobody asks to do anything else. Even for a small miner, you're not going to ask a small miner to do the same thing as Jim Field. Never. Because you cannot, a guy is driving a patinet, he's driving not even a bicycle. So you cannot ask him to have a license to drive, to drive a Elon Musk a cyber truck. Mm. We that's, yeah, well, that, this is it. So things to be adjusted to whatever has to be done, but it has to be, it has to exist. And I think it has to be framed, giving the confidence, giving the legality, giving the formal formality. This is what gives value to the product now. By doing this, of course, you have intermediaries who will disappear because unless they provide real service, like they can get something from a secret source or a secret place or a secret time, uh, it would be difficult for them to make a business. But the, the local miner, the small guy would probably get a better price. And uh, whoever gives a service by, by first of all, disclosing as a service, Giving confidence is the service, giving packaging, talking, marketing, uh, assuring, following your customers. All of this is a service. Mm -hmm. So cutting the merge, cutting, I'm not talking about the fools who have cutting, you have lapidary, you have uh, laboratory is a service, but it's not in the same chain. You know, except Gublin, who does jewelry, they do gemstone, they do laboratory, they do everything. But this is the only organization that I know that, do, that does everything. Mm. Normally, it's, it's it's services that are put together. But this is how the industry has changed, and it will change even more because the technology is right here, and it is giving a chance to the small guy to exist in the same legal, recognizable, and 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 certified way as a big guy. And I think this is good. Yeah, but I uh, think this is good. Yeah, yes, but uh, for example. Uh, the government have to make the small guy legal. And we cannot, uh, you know, as an industry, uh, you know, if you go to a country like Madagascar and uh, nobody has a mining license because the government don't make the thing for small people to have a mining license, so then they are not legal. And then some company told them, oh, I cannot buy stone from Madagascar because the guys are not legal. So you cannot know, go there. I know, I know, I know. I know. So it, I know. It's, uh, you, you can afford the government to, uh, you can no. motivate them to do, but uh, then, uh, you know, if the government don't want to make them legal. No, but I, Vincent, I understand that, but you taking Madagascar, this is the worst example. 
Yeah, but this is the worst an example where I go <laughs> regularly and I have many yeah, issues. Yeah, Colombia I have many with issues there. In yeah. a country like Colombia, where they had no papers but guns, they yeah. were rejecting every government, everything. It made, it was made possible. So, yes, it's a matter of governing. It's a matter of governing. But things are possible to change. They can change everywhere. Yeah. If you I look don't into say, I don't say Zambia, Tanzania, most, everywhere, Mozambique, so they, slow, they have problems. They have Gary Lane in the north. They have problems with the gas. But those people, those countries change little by little. They change at their own space. They will change because it's also a matter of survival. I mean, cows is not good in the end, not even for the for, for the politician, not for the country. So, Madagascar, I know it's a big problem, but it's yes, and it's a big source for gemstone. Now, what is more more of a problem, which is also uh, can be a, a little threatening for uh, for for industry, it's uh, what is happening to the diamond. The diamond, which is, I'm talking about the laboratory made diamond, because you have more and more consumer who think that it's cleaner, better, it's not even, even also cheaper. And why should they invest in the diamond? A diamond where there have been so many scandals, so many uncertainties, so many value that is not, that fall, the, the price of diamond have, fall, have fallen. You know that. So, I mean, there is an uncertainty and people replace because lab grown diamond is a diamond in the end. It's a diamond. So what is happening in our industry? If you've seen the quantity of lab made colored stones on the market today, a lot of companies have come. I mean, we had Gilson, we had the Shatam, we had those people before. With the Perestroika, which was at the, at the beginning of the lab grown diamond, you also had Russian making hydrothermal emeralds and some yeah. of the things. Corindo. And yeah. today, you have people every day. I'm not talking about nanocital because this is really, really, but anyway, this yeah. is giving a option for good looking, beautiful, cheaper diamond that people don't want to invest, but just look that they're wearing good things. And this mm -hmm. is what is changing the mentality. And I, my good friend Frida was telling me the other day, jewelry is the best gift when, because you carry a value and carry poetry and you carry love to them. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you offer as a gift a $60 piece that looks like a $6 million piece, of course, you, okay, <laughs> you, you, this is not the same kind of gift. You understand? Now, I would like uh, uh, Justin to put one of the slides that I give you, which uh, are showing the two pieces on Amazon because I do, I did some French check okay. uh, before. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure if people are aware. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, you will see this. Okay. I got, I got them on two different okay. slides. So I'll, I'll bounce back and forth. Okay. Okay. And this one, well, okay. You can go the other one. The other one, this one is a, uh, this is a stirring silver road created, uh, uh, lab created ruby. Three stones uh, equivalent to they give the 12, 12 carat wells, blah blah blah, and, and cubic. Uh, this is not cubic zirconia. This is uh, I think it is uh, uh, man-made uh, sapphire, white sapphire, something like that. Okay. Did you sell that for? Uh, I don't remember the price. But it's something 40, like forty dollars. Looks like a forty dollars. They this is selling in Amazon, and they start to sell that everywhere. This is selling in. Big, big amounts. Mm -hmm. And people are buying it. And these retail stores, because Amazon is a retail store, mm -hmm. are very influential in changing the mentality of the people here. Why should they spend so much in a real thing? They can buy that for $40. Go to the next slide, the other side. And this one, look, again, because you know, this is not enough. This is 925 sterling silver. People still buy something, they buy silver. With the blue, blue topaz, this is a real stone. Okay, it's a one, Bombardus topaz probably. With a white created sapphire, okay? White created sapphire. What is the price of this one? 60. Can you see the price? Yeah, 60. 60, $60. $60, $60, look at that, $60. Okay, so, but this is a threat. And I've been 
you know, I've always wanted to have somebody do an article because I'm not a writer, but I could do it myself because I'm going to be, I have more time maybe in a few months. Mm-hmm. I do a study on what is available, a whole study of in our industry. What do we have as a threat? What is coming? What is happening? You know, and this is one of the things I think because we haven't been good enough to put our own standards, to be clean to our principle or have enough principle and to stand by our principle, we have seen these things growing because people don't see any value in putting much money in a thing that at the end, because the millennium are putting some more other value in the stone. It's not that the other generation, I think the millennium are putting more, more sentiment, more environment, justice, whatever. Mm-hmm. And that is something that is there. There's nothing we can do. Now, the final word, because I think we don't want to hold the people forever, would yeah. be about the technology now that are, of course, the big, big things. And the technology, everybody's gone into technology because the market, the, the industry has shrinked. People that are selling gemstones are not receiving the orders as before. People who are manufacturing are not manufacturing as before, still doing some business, but it's really shrinked. So people are looking a way to reach the consumer. And reach the consumer is going to the ba- the biggest mall on earth, which is called the internet. Mm. So the internet is a mall. It's a big shopping center. And everybody gets in the same shopping center. You may be in the good alley, in the wrong alley, in the bottom, next to the toilet, because it depends on the technology of the ability to put yourself in the right place with the right marketing, with the right artist. Artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, and with the right people who really know how to use all those uh, logarithmic logarith things, uh, data, data, data analytics, and all that. But this is what is the name of the business today? Again, this is technical. Mm-hmm. All the Romans about the jury, all the Romans about the stones come behind. We have the papers and we have the technology. If you, you have the technology and the papers become even more important, third party verification become even more important because when people buy online or they buy from, from out from far, they want to know that you're certified something, that you got a certificate is even better, and then that you have a past and you have some references. References will become, of course. But the first reference is what do you have as a membership, member of something? or as a certificate. And this, now, the, the rest of the technology, if you look into what is happening in China, uh, you will, I mean, this is just crazy. I mean, I heard the other day, 750 million Chinese consumer buy jewelry or gemstone in one click in less than five minutes. Mm-hmm. Steam, mm-hmm. chosen, and paid. Mm-hmm. And I think this is what is happening. And this is where our industry is going. So the challenges we're facing are huge. And this is going to be shaky for many. Shaky, shaky. And the value of our industry are changing also. This is what is scary is about the value. Because with all this technology, it's a matter of being business-wise on the first place. And you talk origin, you talk true name. Origin, mine image and anybody can hide behind image you know the image is so important marketing becomes so important so you have image search uh belonging association mm-hmm. and that's it mm-hmm. and the end there is a market that will never change is the i i n market because you have the rich they are the knowledge the culture the money and they, they know what they want to buy they want the best and they want the best for themselves so that is my conclusion for tonight. If uh, okay, not the conclusion is for you, Vincent, or uh, you, uh, Justin. Sorry, no, no, sorry, no. Justin. I, I You're making the question. What, what you say is uh, what you say is right, but I think there is hope. For example, you know when you speak about uh, the synthetic something like that, I remember that uh, you see the the Burma Ruby Mine Company by the British was uh, went bankrupt because uh, you had the then uh, synthetic ruby that came at the beginning of the at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. And uh, 100 years later, ruby is uh, stronger than ever. So ruby was able to recover from the arrival of synthetics. 
And uh, I think that uh, at the end, people, you know, they, they have any, uh, people want to learn about gemstone. And when they want to learn about gemstone, uh, for some reason, you know, they prefer to uh, get something natural than something that is made in a lab that has basically no resale value. And uh, because you, you may buy, uh, you know, a, a ring with a synthetic stone, but that stone will, for example, have no resale value. And uh, many Asian people want to be able to transmit value from one generation to the next. So I think that, uh, you know, uh, you say at least for the rich people and uh, people who can afford to have the natural thing, it will uh, still be, uh, you know, uh, different because this is uh, beautiful, this is rare, this is true. And maybe also this is, not everybody can have it. So then they will value that and uh, there will be still people I think to buy it because they want something that is outstanding, outstanding, you know, uh, a natural yeah. ruby or natural hey. diamond that is a real thing. No, of course. Now I'm not saying that the war is lost, but it's, mm -hmm. we're, we're, com we're going through very, very difficult time and only the best will survive because you really need to educate yourself. You need to learn new things. You need to go back to school. You need to think and you need to feel the yeah. water because nobody knows exactly where the water is going. Mm -hmm. So this is very complicated, you know? And I agree and, with uh, you on the standard on things like that. You know, my family, I'm coming from the wine industry and the wine industry is very standardized compared to the gemstone industry. You know, wine, a Bordeaux wine is like that and you have... You know, uh, the industry in Bordeaux is protecting each other, so they are very organized. And on uh, when I compare, for example, the wine industry and the gem industry, I see that the gem industry is much less organized than the wine industry. You have uh, wine industry is uh, holding each other much stronger, and they have a standard on the thing like that. And gem industry is more like uh, chaotic, creative, very creative, chaotic. It's good and bad, but uh, yeah, but I. I I still, uh, I, I hope that with technology and with uh, everything that is coming, there will be challenge, but I, I, I still think that people will love the beautiful natural one and uh, people who can bring some uh, uh, nice, uh, valuable product will still be able to, uh, to have a good yes, business. Yes, they do. Yes, they do, Vincent. But the threat of having those $60 things is there. And some people yeah. will better buy uh, uh, Elon Musk car at hundred thousand dollars, they'll go to a trip on the moon and and wear sixty dollars rings. You know, I we really don't know. <laughs> no, I think I think the real the real uh, competitor now for jewelry is actually other things that are not jewelry, that are yeah, a trip on the moon or a car or uh, uh, some travel or, or things like that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So it is very important to bring back romance and to bring yes. back culture, culture right. behind the jewelry. Original yes. culture, the life of the people that are behind it, the life of the small guy, not dressed in Guantanamo uniform, but eating his food the African way and, you know, dancing with the, the tribe. This is what we need to preserve. And this yeah. is what will make valuable the culture that goes through the borders. This is, I think, what will make valuable our product. We'll make difference from the product that's coming. Hundreds of things that are spit by machines at $60 a piece. Yeah. That will be only no, machines. I totally agree. You see, this is for, for me, you know, the best gift you can do to a gemstone is to associate your gemstone and your brand and yourself and your business to a positive idea, to a, a good story that is uh, that the customer will be happy, you know, to enjoy with the beautiful product that he bought. So, yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree with you. Bringing good stories, associating your stone with your business and your person with a good story. I agree. Okay, so Jean-Claude, here's my here's my final question for you. As a person who's seen this whole transformation from the trade, you know, starting in the 70s and 80s, where you know the videos you showed us, obviously it's a completely different world than the one that I came into and even the one that Vincent came into, you know, 15 years ago. Um, for you for your experience, how is it going to be for, let's say, for somebody like me who's still, you know, pretty new in the trade or even the person that comes after me, you know, I feel like you kind of saw the golden, the golden era. And now we're in a totally different thing with tran transparency and technology, everything that you said. Is there a future for the young people to come in or do we or, or is like the big investor that going to be the only way that somebody can get it, get into the business? 
there is a, I think there is a, I think there is a, I think there is a chance for new people that come in, but people that really understand, people that have a good head first, educated, and understand the the changes and the movement because this is the, the industry is going into a very high technological and and technical uh, area. With marketing is very important with all the tools that are. And people who understand that, no matter what, they can start, you know, it's a matter of reaching out and reaching out. If you reach out, if you're, if you're a small guy, you can reach out. Look, every day you got those, those ladies who blah, blah on, 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 on Instagram and they become very important people because they're influencers of blah, blah. So there are new, well, but there are new things. And you're providing a service with the rapidry. Yeah. Now, people who would come and say, I want to start a gemstone business today, I would say this can be complicated. Yeah. Because this really is complicated. Unless you're a miner or unless you are a big cutter and you make jewelry, some, I mean, unless you have something else, just being a trader, I don't think there is a future. Yeah. There's no future for traders. There's no future for wholesalers. Well, wholesaler will disappear with time. I think it would still be wholesalers, but very few providing a tremendous service. Yeah, I think I totally agree with what you're saying. I, to me, what it looks like is once you know the technology, as you said, once you know the industry, then you also have to be very creative. You know, like you said, bring back the romance, but you're going to have to do it in a new way. You can't. We're not going to be able to do it in the way of the '70s or the '80s because it doesn't reach. No, no. It doesn't reach no, no. anybody now. So no, no, no. You need to know the technology, even the one that you don't know yet that have not come out. You need to be on the lookout to understand what is coming out. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this is going so fast. Yeah. Look into China. Look at what they're doing in China. Yeah. They go so fast, and people don't even understand so fast it goes. You know, and then they say, "Oh, this is because the Chinese." No, no. Look into it. It goes I think, so fast. It's I think for crazy. us, this is this is one thing that's lucky to be in Bangkok because we're so close, and we see. I think yes. we see things earlier yes. than everyone else. Yes, 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 I agree, I agree. Well, this has been so a... It's about uh, investing in skills. Yeah. If, uh, if you're a young yes, person now, you have to uh, invest in skills, uh, becoming yes. a, a gemologist, maybe becoming a, a gem cutter, learning about cutting, learning about how to communicate on the uh, internet, how to take good photographs, have uh, multiple skills and be able to, uh, to adapt. Yeah. To adapt. And I think... And cutters will always be needed. Yeah, I think one thing, one thing that isn't emphasized enough is really you got you have to get all that stuff that Vincent just said, but then you have to have a dream or you have to have a, a new idea, a new creative idea that no one's had. Otherwise, you know, there's millions of gem cutters, there's millions of dealers, there's millions of, of everything. There's millions of miners, but the miner who goes on Instagram and sells or whatever, that guy thought of a new idea, you know, or, or whatever. You know, so many different ideas that people have, but... So you, it's not just education. You have to have an idea as well. I think you know anyone can get education, but not that many people are shooting the car to the moon or, or whatever. You know, some you know. So that's going to be uh, essential for whoever's going to be the successful next generation person. From what I've you know what I'm seeing. So this has been an awesome talk. You need good cutters. Yeah. The industry yeah. needs good cutters. As long as you have rough coming, you need good cutters. People able to cut or recut stone. You know, uh, I think this is a skill, like, uh, if I was starting now, I think I would learn how to cut or recut a stone. The first thing I would do. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, yeah, uh, Jean-Claude, this has been an excellent talk. Uh, this is maybe has been one of my favorites so far. I feel like we said so much in, in a really short time. So I just want to thank you and thanks to all of our guests for once again uh, hanging out with us on a Wednesday night uh, or maybe Wednesday morning for you. And um, yeah, you know, there's so many more things we, we, we could say about, uh, I know there's more questions about Columbia that people had been, whatever, but we, we said a lot. So thank you for, you know, giving us your wisdom and your knowledge and your experience and some cool old vintage videos from the 70s. Um, if so, if people want to follow uh, Jean-Claude, um, here's some of his... Um, his social media stuff and uh, Instagram is is his daughter and the company that they're running. So if you guys want to follow yeah. what they're doing, um, and of course, in color yeah, magazine. Not much. 
we didn't speak at all about in color, but if people want to follow your uh, personal views, you're you're always have the sort of the first editorial in 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 color, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, well, um, any, any, have we said everything we needed to say tonight or anything else we need to say before the end? Uh, uh, Vincent, uh, next week we're speaking to uh, Philippe Bruno. What's... Yeah, what's... next week it will be uh, Philippe. And uh, Philippe Bruno is uh, the young guy who uh, basically turned me into a uh, uh, video. And, uh, you know, before him, I didn't want to travel with anybody, with a cameraman or something like that. I was just thinking about... Uh, writing article and taking photographs. And, uh, but uh, some people, uh, you know, push hard in order for, told me that a video was the future because they say that, you know, people complain, this and you're writing article, but they are too long. I don't like to read and things like that. So uh, I, one day I traveled with Philippe Bruno and, uh, and uh, when a uh, few years later, after five years, uh, you know, he uh, finally uh, finished uh, his uh, video about uh, the expedition that we had. When I saw the result, I was impressed. And then I understood that, okay, I had to change my mind a little bit and I had to accept to travel with a cameraman because actually, if I want to show what is going on at the source and uh, you know, provide uh, information to uh, people in the, in the industry and uh, the final customer also about uh, all the things I had the privilege to see when I was going uh, visiting mining areas, the best way to do was to have a cameraman. And also I found out that uh, if I want to provide traceability to my customer, basically the lab, and to prove him that I indeed collected this sample on site at this mine that day, the best way to do was to have a cameraman documenting the whole thing and then providing this data where somebody in the lab can also follow the, the expedition. And uh, I saw that with, uh, with Philippe and uh, I started working with Philippe in uh, 2007, and uh, now this is uh, 13 years that we uh, we are working together. So it would be a pleasure to have him next week to discuss a little bit about the adventure we had together in the field. Cool. So yeah, that should be good. Looking forward to that one. Okay. Well, um, thanks everybody. Thank you, Jean Claude and um, Vincent. I'll see you next week. Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. It was great. And definitely. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you guys.